Thank you. That was great. Um, so we're running a little bit behind, so we're, I'm going to move on. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Dan George, who is coming down the street from Duke. Um, he is going to talk to us about adjuvant treatment of, I have the ones you sent me. Did yeah, you but I always them? make changes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Tracy. You're you don't fine. know that about me? <laughs> but, I mean, I can use those if. No, no, no. We can, we can. Um, but if I can't, but it's just take a second. Try not to send them to you to just before, but it's still not good. Call it a nervous habit, but I like to keep making changes. It should be under adjuvant. This one? Here we go. Well, thanks, folks, for coming out and braving the weather. Uh, it actually wasn't that bad. I don't know what it was like earlier. But uh, it's mostly rain now. I think you'll be getting home mm -hmm. fine. Uh, but I'm from New England. You know, this is like, you know, this is like late September, early October weather for us. So um, I'm used to it. Okay, great. Well, th and thanks, Tracy, for organizing all of this and, and, and Matt and for everybody. This has been, uh, I think, maybe now four years, five years I've been doing this. Six, seven, eight, eight. A long time. I, I, I'm sorry. I haven't been to all of them, but they're, they're, this, I think this is really a great effort, and we're going to continue to make efforts to get uh, more people out to participate and listen because it's a unique forum. It's an opportunity for us to talk uh, a little bit more casually about the, um, the things we do uh, from surgery. And, and as you saw from Dr. Riggs, you know, fantastic opportunity. How many times do you get a chance to see that and hear him narrate through uh, you know, what, what it's like from a surgeon's view uh, dealing with kidney cancer. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you as a medical oncologist uh, at Duke, uh, but really just as a medical oncologist and kidney cancer advocate uh, of what it's like dealing with patients right after that surgery, and particularly for the patients that have um, that higher risk uh, procedure, like he showed you removing the inferior vena cava tumor thrombus. You know, what do we, what do we say, what do we do for patients like that? that I think are, are, you know, and honest, facing a high likelihood of that cancer coming back. For many of these folks, it's more likely than not that the cancer is going to come back. And even, even if it comes back slowly, even if it comes back, you know, asymptomatic, it's still a disease uh, in the metastatic setting, the stage four setting, that we, you know, we, we can control for a long time, but we generally can't cure. And, and that's a disease, you know, patients live with for a while eventually suffering from it and, and many folks dying from it. So, so it's our biggest unmet need. Um, and, and although we've developed a ton of drugs for treating and, and managing and helping people live longer and live better with um, stage four metastatic disease, we have no therapies for these patients that have um, just gone through the surgery Dr. Riggs showed you for this kind of high risk disease. And it's really been one of the areas we've been working on for a decade. So I'm going to give you an update on something that we're excited about because it's a new approval uh, for kidney cancer and give you some context and why it's still controversial uh, out there when you talk to doctors and, and why that might be. So just a couple of slides here on the epidemiology of kidney cancer. Um, as you know, this is, uh, this is a common disease. I mean, all of you have been touched by it and directly or indirectly, and, and there's many, many more. 64,000 cases just in the U.S., and 14,000 deaths. And that may not sound like a lot when you compare all of cancer or other things, but for patients with kidney cancer, you know, that's a, that's a one in four, one in five chance of dying, and that's, that's too high. Um, surgical resection is uh, the standard of care for localized kidney cancer, and it's going to continue to be. You, you saw what, what Dr. Riggs offered there. I mean, it's tremendous. And it's, uh, these are big cancers. Many of these cancers, because we don't screen, like mammograms and, and PSAs, we don't have that for, for kidney cancer. Many of these patients presenting with, with large tumors. Um, and, and taking them out really does a tremendous service. So that's not going away. That's going to continue to be how we manage a lot of kidney cancer, stage 1, 2, and 3 kidney cancer. And then relapse for particularly those stage three kidney cancers um, is, a, is a real unmet need. And um, this is the latest SEER data. So that's our Medicare data uh, across the country for, from 2016. 
and the five-year survival rate in SEER for stage four kidney cancer is 12%. Now, we may do a lot better than that in academic centers uh, for patients that are motivated and resourced, but the fact remains is that for many patients in the population, this is still, you know, a very, very lethal disease at stage four. Dr. Riggs went through this staging, so I'm not going to go through it all, but that stage three and really that kind of localized stage four cancer that's kind of gone through Gerota's fashion, maybe into a regional lymph node, um, that's still potentially resectable disease, and that's all that we're doing surgery on. But those are the patients at highest risk for disease recurrence. And we know that from this group. This is the UCLA group, and they did this international staging um, criteria, and it, and it was based on the stage that we just showed you. Uh, the grade, which is separate from stage, so grade is what the cancer looks like under the microscope. And you can have a really aggressive grade and a low stage early cancer, or you could have a really uh, advanced stage disease, but it's a sort of moderate to low grade cancer. So they, they tend to track together, but not always. And you can see they the grading system is on a scale of one to four, and threes and fours are the aggressive ones. Um, ECOG PS is performance status. That's functional status. That's how the patients feel and how they're performing. Are they completely asymptomatic or are they hindered in some way? Have they lost 20 pounds of weight? Do they have flank pain? Are they limited in some way by this, uh, by this disease? And a one means you're still pretty functional, but you do have some symptoms. And then they just break it down into the score, sort of a stratification of low, intermediate, or high risk. And the high risk are the ones, those are the T3, T4 tumors. Those are the ones at highest risk for recurrence. And, and here's the data for that. The high risk patients, they're only 13, thankfully 14% of the population of kidney cancer patients. Most patients we're catching earlier, despite the fact we don't screen for kidney cancer. But the five-year recurrence rate is nearly 60%. So this is the group of patients we know we're worried about. They're worried about it. We're worried about it. And yet the standard of care is to just wait and watch. And that's our biggest concern. The other populations, the intermediate and the low risk, we're less as worried about because the likelihood is the cured. And there, maybe it's a little harder to justify sort of treatment on people who might most likely be cured. But for the high-risk patients, that's where, you know, we really felt the unmet need. And this was the case in 2006 and 2005 when the first drugs for kidney cancer were being FDA approved since high dose II in 1992. So, so we were at a new period of time, not unlike sort of where we are today with immunotherapies now, just kind of coming into the field of kidney cancer, these checkpoint inhibitors, kind of a new revolution, if you will. In 2006, that was a revolution of these uh, oral therapies that could block uh, angiogenesis. And we were excited about them. And we were sort of revisiting the question of adjuvant treatment. Could we really change the course for these patients? So this is what a typical patient might look like, um, you know, uh, in their 50s, early 60s, more often male than female, usually, you know, still in the prime of their careers and, and life. And and family and everything might present with a large tumor like this with some abdominal pain, uh, flank pain, uh, or some blood in their urine, and uh, might have some other uh, medical conditions, but surgery would be indicated. It's a 12-centimeter tumor. It invaded through the perinephric fat, so it's stage 3 cancer. Um, it's clear cell type, which is the most common type uh, and, and is the most responsive to our anti-angiogenic agents and there were no lymph nodes involved. So uh, he's a performance status one, he's a grade three, he's a stage three. He's in that sort of high risk category for disease recurrence. And up until very recently, the only standard of care was to wait and watch. Um, so we did this, a number of studies, and I'll, and I'll show you all of them uh, in brief, but one in particular that has led to this approval and they're all based on this endpoint called disease-free survival. And that's basically whether or not a patient has recurred in terms of their cancer. Now, there's other ways we can define this in terms of um, whether it's radiographic recurrence or whether it's clinical recurrence or whether they've developed some other complication like another cancer or whatnot. But by and large, we're talking about that kidney cancer coming back. 
and um, long-term disease-free survival is really the goal for our patients. If you think about it, after you've had surgery, your, can't, your doctor says, I got it all, but I'm worried it could come back. We're gonna do scans and follow you. The primary concern for our patients in that scenario, and many of you, some of you may have been there, is you know hoping this cancer doesn't come back. Yes, you're worried about, are you gonna live to age 80 or 83? Um, yes, you're worried about overall survival, but your main concern is, is the cancer gonna come back? Is this cancer gonna kill me? Um, am I gonna have to do treatment for this cancer you know, in, you know, for the rest of my life? So that is, to me, when I talk to patients, their biggest concern. It's been an endpoint for all, almost all of our solid tumor studies that we do in breast cancer and in, in colon cancer, melanoma. Yes, they may also show some advantage for the overall survival of the population, but the main goal, you know, for those studies have always been based on disease-free survival, and all of our adjuvant studies in kidney cancer are based on that endpoint. And so it's been sort of an approval endpoint, but we've never approved a drug in kidney cancer for stage three disease, so this was new. This was a new endpoint to really assess. It's one of the reasons the FDA ca called a special panel to look at some of this data. So this is the uh, group of patients that we focused on in this study called S-TRAC, and I'll walk you through it in a minute. Um, this was a study looking specifically at one drug, sunitinib, that was approved in 2006 uh, for treatment of metastatic kidney cancer. And um, we wanted to look at it in this setting, in this sort of stage three, T3, T4 setting, or patients that had nodal disease involvement. I already told you nodal disease is sort of like a localized stage four, that, that didn't require you had a big tumor. You could have a T2 tumor if you had nodal disease. But there was only a small percentage of patients, thankfully, that present like that. Most of the patients in the study were T3 or T4. And most of them, as you see, will, you know, had some symptoms associated with it. This was the study design that we did. Um, and there was a lot of assumptions going into this. Um, we, again, decided to choose these this particular patient population, not all the adjuvant studies focused on this population. We um, specifically focused on the UISS risk group criteria. So we included that performance status before surgery. Um, we uh, randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to the drug sunitinib and, uh, versus placebo. And we said would treat patients for a year. That was pretty common for, this other, for the other adjuvant studies. What was different for our study um, was that we focused exclusively on clear cell, was that um, we um, had a blinded independent review decide on whether or not the cancer had come back. Um, investigators obviously are going to be making those assessments as well, but we had a separate committee look at this, and it's really probably the cleanest way to do a, an endpoint. It's not necessarily the clinically practical thing. None of us are going to do that in practice, but it is from a population perspective, the most consistent way to make sure that all the cases are judged the same way, not, you know, one investigator judging differently than another. So it, it really is from a FDA regulatory perspective, the cleanest endpoint. And, um, and we had one other thing which we didn't make a big deal of at the time, but we think actually turned out to be probably one of the most important aspects, and that is we wrote our study to say you could lower the dose down one time to 37.5 milligrams from 50 milligrams, but you couldn't go below that. If you went below that, you took them off study. And the thinking was is that we get down to a lower dose, it may have no activity. And since these are patients that we have no tumor to judge, we'll have no idea of whether or not that lower dose is helping or just hurting. So we set a bar and said 37.5 milligrams is as low as you go, anything lower than that, and and we stop. And the reason for that was based on our metastatic data that suggested that, that many patients at those lower doses don't have as much drug exposure um, or changes in blood pressure or other measures to suggest a, a benefit to this therapy. But it was an assumption. We don't know that going into the study. So, um, so these were the characteristics of the patients. You can see most of these patients in their 50s. Um, these are younger patients on average that, that want to do an aggressive treatment like this. Um, but we had you know, patients over 65 as well. Um, you can see mostly male, that's pretty common. Um, you can see our performance status 
Um, most of these patients were performance status zero. This is at baseline, this is after surgery. So after surgery, the cancer's out. The only thing that's affecting you now is your surgical recovery. And 75% of the patients were recovered from surgery fully. So this is the other characteristics we see. And the T3 high are the patients that had these kind of T3 stage 3 cancers that were also symptomatic with performance status. So that was about half of our population. So it was a sicker, slightly sicker, slightly more aggressive population than than maybe some other studies uh, had focused on. And we did that on purpose because we felt they were the highest risk. We also had the, the node positive patients in there at about 8%. And then you can see most of these were the high grade threes or fours. Um, and these were the patient characteristics on treatment. And I put this up front because I want people to know this. We intend to treat patients with 50 milligrams um, on and off, you know, four weeks on, two weeks off, for a year. We don't always treat patients for a year. Um, you, you can see we have to also, uh, the mean duration was 9.5 months, so not everybody made it a whole year. Um, how about half of the patient had dose reductions to 37.5, and about half of the patients had interruptions where we had to stop the, the drug before they made it out to four weeks. And that, that occurred multiple times in patients. So that's not to be a negative. That shouldn't be viewed as a failure. That's a personalized approach to how we manage patients. We dose everybody the same, and we're obviously all different from metabolism to body size to age. You have to do that and recognize that we're trying to give patients a full dose that they can tolerate, but that's going to be a frequent thing, and some people view that as a negative. I, I don't. It turns out the patients that have dose reductions actually do better live longer in the stage four setting, metastatic setting. So we think that that's actually a good thing when we see, you know, we can keep people on, but we have to make those changes. Um, there's a lot of different um, effects here in terms of uh, what happened to paper, people. You can see the, the discontinuation for adverse events, about 25%. So again, can't, not everybody can tolerate it for a whole year. That's okay. You know, if you took it for nine months or six months and that's all you could tolerate it, you still got the benefit associated with this. This was the benefit that we saw. And, um, you know, we, we think this is a really remarkable effect. This was a 25% reduction in the likelihood of this cancer coming back. We, we treated people for up to a year. That was the treatment per period, zero to one year. And that treatment effect was beneficial all the way out to five years or more. In fact, if you look at five years, we had an 8% absolute benefit in survival. And, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable. If, if you look here at one year, the first year, we cut down the recurrence rate by 50%. And you might say, well, that's just because you're on treatment. But that's good. The treatment works. It cut down 50% of the recurrences. Then the curves start to come together again. And you can imagine some of those were just delays in recurrences. We didn't really kill it. We just delayed it and coming back. But after two years, the curves are still separate, and they stay separate throughout the rest of the population, throughout the rest of the period, treatment period, all the way out. And they never really cross, and it really suggests that there is perhaps not just a delay in recurrence, but there could be a real prevention. And maybe it's 8% like it is at five years, but that's a 1 in 12. So that means you have to treat 12 patients to save somebody from recurrence that wouldn't, would have otherwise recurred. That's not a bad ratio for a drug that is, you know, tolerable, albeit with some significant side effects. So that's sort of how we look at this. Some people look at this data and say, well, you know, there's a delay in the median recurrence from 5.6 years to 6.8 years. So you're do treating for a year to delay the recurrence 1.2 years. But I really see that as a reductionist view because it's only looking at one time point, and it really doesn't take into account all of the data for the whole population. I don't know where the patient I'm talking to is going to be on that curve, if they're going to recur in a year or if they're never going to recur. The best way to explain this data is to show all of it, and the hazard ratio, that chance of recurrence of you know, 0.76, is probably the best summation of this data overall. But I like to give patients that five-year time point because I think that's what we're looking at, right? We want to know 
you know, are there some patients that are cured by taking this drug in the adjuvant saying that wouldn't be cured otherwise? Now, I don't know that we can say that at five years, but the curves are pretty much flattening out for recurrence. And that's four years off drug and still an 8% greater likelihood. Some of those patients are probably going to be cured, but we just don't know that yet. If you look across the subgroups, they're pretty much all shifted in favor of uh, the sunitinib arm here, and um, particularly when we look at some of the higher risk ones, so the T3 high or the node positive ones are shifted over even a little bit more. Uh, it's interesting, age over 65 did well, but they're kind of all over the map for aging, so I don't try to break it out too much. The main point is that everybody was shifted over in favor of sunitinib. This is the overall survival, and a lot of folks have looked at this and said, well, this is, you know, not a positive study because it didn't show overall survival. Well, number one, this study wasn't large enough to show an overall survival. Secondly, only about 20, 25 percent of the patients have passed away, so we, we don't really know that. And the patients that have passed away have mostly passed away from really aggressive kidney cancer that occurred early and probably weren't the ones we're going to be able to cure. It's probably the ones that are a little bit less aggressive that we're going to be able to cure. Um, it's just too early to judge to whether or not these curves are separating or not. The hazard ratio isn't 1, it's 0.9, and it's mostly by the end here. So it'll be interesting to see if there's a trend to this, but it'll never be statistically significant because that wasn't the power or the size of the study. So it's a little bit of an unfair assessment to say this is negative for overall survival because we just, we just don't know that yet. And this study probably won't ever be able to answer it. But one thing that is clear from this study is that disease-free survival really matters. So if you look at this study and the patients that recurred, regardless of ARM, whether they're on placebo or sunitinib, and if they recurred within two years, they had about a 40% chance of living five years. You can see 164 died within five years, 97 are still alive beyond five years. Whereas the patients that lived beyond two years, um, those pa that, that, that recurred beyond two years, those patients had about a 90% chance of living five years or more. So just making it two years makes a huge difference in your five-year survival. And, and many of us in the field know this. Uh, and that's a 15-fold odds ratio. That's a huge odds ratio. It's the positive predicted value, 90%. This is a really positive signal. We'll need to do this in other studies to confirm. But disease-free survival is going to be a really important endpoint for this disease going forward. Um, you know, uh, dose, uh, adverse events were pretty common. I'm not going to go through all these things. There were a lot of manipulations, as I said. Most patients, almost everybody had some adverse events, and 20% had serious ones, like meaning you have to go in the hospital. Grade 3 means it's, you know, maybe a modification in your medication, blood pressure, other things. doesn't necessarily mean you have to go in the hospital. But temporary discontinuations were common, and permanent discontinuations were 28%. Um, these are the side effects we saw. What's interesting is the serious ones, the sort of grade four hospitalized ones, were not that common, which is good. Um, we made dose modifications before things got really severe uh, in most cases. And when we did have to stop, the most, reason, most common reason why we had to stop therapy was because of PPE. This is that hand-foot syndrome that patients get on their hands. That was the most common reason. Blood pressure and fatigue were the others, but were less common. And I mention that because this hand-foot syndrome, though it's a real hassle and pain for patients, is not life-threatening. No one's going to die from having skin peeled on their hands. So it's important to recognize what's serious and you know what's important but not necessarily serious. Um, these are the other adjuvant studies. We've got six of them. I mean, it's remarkable. We really, the field really invested a lot in doing uh, studies in this setting. And I'm going to just show two other ones because they're the only others that have been reported out, the Assure and the Protect. The Assure was a cooperative group study. It was three arms of sunitinib and serafinib versus placebo. 
same treatment a year, but could be clear cell or non-clear cell, and took a wider range of patients. And then the PROTECT study was also a year, like this s track study was just clear cell and uh, focused a little bit more on aggressive disease, included some T2 tumors as well, but more overlapping. This was the ASSURE study design, and those were the three arms. And again, they had um, at 50 milligrams, four weeks on, two weeks off to start. About two-thirds of the way through the study, they changed it. Um, they felt that these drugs were too toxic. Uh, not enough patients were completing them. A lot of patients were dropping off. And so they lowered the dose for the sunitinib and the serafinib down to 37.5 and allow for lower, they allowed for lower dosing down to 25. And I'll show you the effect of that. This was their overall survival, this was their disease-free survival curve. There was no difference between the three arms. And then this is the PROTECT study, which was more like the S-TRAC, um, but was using a different drug, uh, pazopinib or Votrian. Uh, at its full dose initially, and then again about halfway through, switched to a lower do starting dose because of this. And what was interesting in the PROTECT study is their primary analysis was looking at that lower dose, but their secondary analysis looked back at the group of patients that did the full dose to start, and that's where they saw the disease-free survival benefit was in that group. And it wasn't a retrospective, this is prospectively looked at a similar hazard ratio, about a 30% reduction in the risk of recurrence, and again, pretty durable out to at least four years. So why did S-TRAC succeed? I would say that PROTECT, like S-TRAC, probably would have succeeded if they had stuck with it, um, because dose matters, and we know this in our patients in the metastatic setting. If you have um, doses, and, and I shouldn't really say dose, it's really dose exposure. So if you have a drug exposure above the median, you not only have a longer time to disease progression, you have a better overall survival. And the best way to judge that is, believe it or not, side effects. The patients that get side effects and have to lower their dose are still having a high drug exposure and are probably getting the maximum benefit. These are dose-dependent drugs, just like chemotherapy. And if you lower down chemotherapy too much, you lose the effect. And I think what happened in Assure was that we lost the effect. So a third of patients started at a lower dose and they allowed these dose reductions. And we see that there was about a third less dose given overall, 68 versus 96 exposure over the 12 month period. Yeah. Are you saying the side effects are good? No, did not say good. I said the side effects are real and they need to be managed and half or more of the patients have to have dose adjustments and sometimes multiple interruptions. They're good in the sense that they show the drugs are working. Yeah, if you have an elevation in your blood pressure, that's a good indicator. It's what we call a, a biomarker or maybe a surrogate for benefit. Those patients live longer, and it doesn't matter which drug you judge. All of them in that class, if your blood pressures are going up, you're hitting, we're hitting the targets, we're having the treatment effects. And that's been shown over and again. It's true as well with diarrhea or the hand foot syndrome, but probably not as reliably measured as the blood pressure. So but there, there they no go side, hand in hand. There are no side effects that could be a sign that the dose is not working. It could be a sign that that's not enough dose. Believe it or not, there's some people that probably could do more than 50 milligrams. And and you know, with other drugs, whatever their doses are. We do flat dosing in everybody. That doesn't mean that's gonna be the same exposure in everybody. There's gonna be a big range. And some folks, it'll be low. Can we experiment with more than 18 milligrams of, uh, so I call it Votrin? Yeah. Can we experiment with higher doses? <clears throat> they, they did a, a phase one study, or those earlier studies to do that. The problem was is that there was too high a rate of toxicity in say like the liver. Now it might not have been a problem for another patient maybe could have gone up to 1600 but for the general population it was too high to go above that. So you know but this is where we don't have individual dosing and ideally with a drug like these that are chronic you, you do that. We don't really haven't really figured out even despite 10 years of, of working with these drugs how to do that yet. This is the drug exposure. This is actually what the FDA put together for us um, for the Assure study. 
Um, and 75% of the recommended daily you know, drug was uh, what they used as a cutoff, so that would be 37.5. And you can see um, that you know, only about 60% had that in the first cycle, and then it goes down to 50% or less so quickly the majority of patients on a shore were getting you know, less than the exposure. This is the S-track exposure, and you can see you go out to about cycle five before you drop below 50% of the population. So, so we think this is a significant difference between these studies. We think this is one of the main reasons why we see effect with, a sh with S-track and not with a shore, and with the subgroup of Protec that got the full dose. Um, the other reason is that the population was very specific. It was focused specifically on the T3 and the node positive patients, and that the, the Assure population included a lot of others. And when you treat patients that have a low risk of recurrence, you're going to lower your threshold for tolerance to side effects, and that's going to affect how you manage your whole population. Um, so it, it's important to recognize there are some other ongoing studies now, and we're very excited about the immunotherapy field. And these are two of them. This is one with a tezolizumab versus placebo, and another one with pembrolizumab. These are PD-1 or PD-L1 um, antibodies, so they block a key checkpoint. And this checkpoint, um, PD-L1, has been shown to be really important in, in, you know, drugs like this, nivolumab in particular, have been FDA approved in kidney cancer uh, because it's shown a survival benefit. And, and we think this is a really important aspect, sort of a new way of treating kidney cancer, and, uh, and one that, that we're very glad is being explored. And these are studies that are exploring it after surgery. Um, there's a, there is a study looking at the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab after surgery as well. And there was recent data that just came out this year showing a benefit to that combination in the metastatic disease setting over SUTEN. So, to what extent that might be a benefit in the adjuvant setting, we don't know, but it's certainly exciting. And then one that we're in, and I know the UNC folks are supporting this too, um, one study we have at Duke is the, is the uh, PROSPER study where we're going to be looking at patients prior to resection. So before Dr. Riggs does that operation, we're going to try to biopsy and then treat these patients with six weeks of immunotherapy, nivolumab in this case and then do the resection, and then do another six uh, doses of that, um, or six months of treatment, versus just straight surgery. And so that's two, that's another approach. We like this because it gets the immunotherapy involved before we remove all the tumor to get the immune system engaged. And again, this is going to be looking at recurrence-free survival and overall survival and safety and tolerability. So it's a big study. We're hoping it'll be a positive study. Um, and I think these are important studies. But I think to end, what, why, why do we want to treat these patients? I think that there's a high risk of recurrence. There's substantial morbidity and mortality associated with this disease. Now I can take out there's no approved adjuvant therapy. Sunitinib was approved um, last month by the FDA for this treatment based on this S-TRAC data. We think that um, patients should make an individual decision. This should be something we present to folks and let them decide if the side effects are worth it, if the 25% reduction in recurrence is worth it, if they're high enough risk to justify trying this. And then I think clinical trials are a good alternative. You know, this is something where patients are not sure they want to do that, but they, they don't want to do it, nothing. This is a really good alternative to try some of these immunotherapies or you know, uh, very active watch and wait. So, so that's where we are in kidney cancer today, and uh, we're excited. We're, we're hoping the next five years we're beyond this, that we've got more studies and we're doing even better than sunitinib alone. But this is a great start. We're very proud of the study we did and the work that went into it. We're very appreciative of the patients uh, in this area and elsewhere that, that participated in it, and, uh, and thank you for being kidney cancer supporters. That's it.
So how do you address that? Yeah, you know, I, I hope that the studies will change to allow for um, plus or minus sutent um, and, and not do a placebo. The placebo was set up when there was no adjuvant. And now that there is an adjuvant option, my hope would be that you could do Pembro versus, you know, patient's choice, sutent or, or observation. Um, because I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure we can kind of lump everybody, you know, into the placebo arm. And, and it'd be hard to compare this otherwise to the sutent. So that, that would be my hope. But I, I'm not in charge of those studies. I don't know if they'll change. So in the absence of that change, what I'd say to patients is that, look, you know, um, there is a benefit associated with sunitinib, and there is a toxicity associated with it. Make that decision first. And if you decide, no, I don't want to do that level of toxicity for that potential benefit, then you should do the clinical trial. But if you put the clinical trial before the standard of care, I, I don't know any other setting that we do that in. So to me, you know, I think that, you know, it, but again, this is a subset of patients, and they may not, you know, the clinical trials may have a broader population of patients who that's not appropriate for. So some you can start right there, but for many others, I, th I think you have to start with the standard of care.